Okay, hi everyone. Um, it's nice to see a, a full room. Thank, thanks for joining us for uh, this seminar. So it, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Hernan Galperin. Um, Hernan is an associate professor at the Annenberg School in Los Angeles. Uh, he's also a director of the Annenberg Research Network on International Communication. Um, I've I've been an admirer of Lat Hernan's work for quite a while now. He, he, he does a whole range of stuff. He's a, he's a key figure in the world of ICT and development. He's published key texts about growth and connectivity. Uh, he's published about digital divides, and he's published about platform work in the gig economy in the global south, which is what we'll be talking about uh, today. Um, he's also at the moment running, or uh, I don't know if I can say running in present tense, Running involved. involved involved with the the future of work in the global south program, uh, and th this program it examines how online platforms are affecting labor markets in in the global south. Uh, it pays attention to questions of discrimination in hiring. Right, no worries. Uh, and gender sorting into op occupation. So it, it's it's quite a, a groundbreaking. Um, program of work, and it's, it's a program of work that, um, that myself and some of the, the Fair Work team who are here in the room here at Oxford, we're, we're grateful and excited to be, to be part of. And I don't know if you're going to say any, anything about the FOEX program in, in the talk here, but a little, maybe. But go ahead. Okay. Um, but, well, I, I won't say any more, but so his, his talk today is, is called Algorithmic or Human Bias, Understanding Discrimination in the Gig Economy. I think Hernan will speak for about 45 minutes. We'll have uh, 15 minutes or so at the end for questions. We have a wine reception after this that you're all welcome to join right outside of this room. So please stick around if you want to ask questions in a bit more of an informal setting. So thanks, Hernan. Thank you, Mark. Um, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, I was here at the OAI probably I believe it was 17 years ago, 2002 or three, and I have to say I was, I was, I was a little bitter and disappointed because I, I had just been hired by USC, and when I arrived to USC, I found out that my favorite colleague, Bill Dutton, was going to leave and run this little-known Internet Institute at Oxford. Um, but uh, obviously it was a great choice for him and for the OII and, and extraordinary things that happened since. Uh, but I'm really uh, happy to, to be back and um, presenting uh, some of my new research on discrimination in, in the gig economy. Let me, let me start by, by sharing with you um, some images that illustrate what discrimination in hiring look 50 or, or 100 years ago, and obviously you can see that it was, it was very explicit. It was easy to spot. You could not miss it. It was discrimination based on, on gender, on race, nationality. Um, it was explicit. It was easy to spot. And, and, and in many ways, it was sanctioned or condoned by the law. And obviously, a lot has changed since then. Um, social attitudes have changed, and probably most uh, importantly, uh, legislation has changed. And, and, and today we have in, in a majority of countries legislation that in one way or another bans discrimination in hiring on, on the basis of what are called protected characteristics, on gender and sexual orientation and nationality and race and, and so forth. But we know discrimination can't just be out legislated and we know from many studies that discrimination in hiring continues uh, to this day but it has become a lot harder to detect and, and that's one of the challenges it's become because there's no explicit screening rule as there was it's a lot harder to detect for example let's, let's suppose, a, suppose a, a black man sees a sign help wanted puts on some nice clothes, prepares a CV, goes in and hands over this resume. And, and uh, the white manager says, thank you very much, and proceeds to just put the resume 
in the trash can. And this is a resume full of trash can of black men who come to the store and he, without even looking, puts him in the trash can. Or the same uh, black uh, man with a traditional black sounding name puts his resume on, on an online uh, site for jobs and his telephone is not ringing. Whereas uh, similarly qualified white candidates do get callbacks. So that's discrimination. However, it's a lot harder to spot. It's a lot harder to, to detect. Now, one way we can go about it is, OK, let's go on the other side. Let's count outcomes. So we can do that. And it's important to do that. So we can count how many blacks or Hispanics or women work in a particular organization. And they'll tell us quite a lot, but, but that counting outcomes only gets us so far because a disparity in outcome is not necessarily evidence of discrimination. We have to, it may be, but we have to go deeper than that to really show that an employee or a job candidate with similar skills and qualification are systematically receiving different treatment based on gender or race or some other protected characteristics. So it's become a lot harder to detect discrimination. Um, and, and, and again, counting outcomes uh, would only get us so far for a number of reasons. One of them is arguably no two people are the same, and arguably perhaps no two jobs are the same. So we, we have the classic counterfactual problem in attributing causality in, in, in the social science. We often lack the data. We don't know the pool of applicants, for example. That's one of the main challenges that we have in discrimination studies. And perhaps more importantly, the fact that discrimination is often unconscious. We know that. It's often unconscious. It's, it's even, though, even it's not apparent to those that are, that are discriminating. But of course, this is what we tend to worry a lot about today. Discrimination by algorithm. That algorithms are filtering, they're scoring job candidates without much human intervention. And the work that's done here at Oxford and many other places is showing us that this was, could be reproducing or even exacerbating discrimination, maybe because the training data sets are embedded with previous discrimination practices. Uh, the choice of predictors, the choice of the outcome or objective function of the uh, algorithm, all this could produce discrimination through algorithm. Now, I want to argue in this talk that despite a legitimate preoccupation with algorithms, we should not lose sight of the fact that much of the discrimination in hiring today in the gig economy is driven by plain old human bias. And I'm going to argue that the rise of the gig economy is perhaps exacerbating discrimination in hiring, not through so much through algorithms, but by creating conditions that favor the activation of stereotypes in human decision making. Because these stereotypes are working as, as cognitive shortcuts for employees that are hiring in a very rapid, uh, fast-paced environment for spot jobs and where the supply of workers, as Mark's work has shown, vastly outnumbers the, num uh, the number of jobs available. So I'm going to walk you through a series of studies where, where I show how this discrimination mechanism works in, in the gig economy. I'm going to probe into, into the implications. And at the end, hopefully, we'll have some time to discuss some potential remedies um, for this. Now, uh, a quick word on, uh, uh, on my research setting. So my research setting are what called the online gig, online freelance platforms. So that's my main research setting. And these are platforms that you probably have heard or, or know about. Freelancer.com, that's actually my, where I do most of my studies. There's also Upwork. Um, this is a picture I took on the metro, actually, uh, on my way from Heathrow to London. It's uh, another big platform, uh, Fiverr. Very interesting choice of images, but that's for somebody else or for another talk. Um, so this is the, the, the research setting that I, am, that I am looking at. And all these platforms, they're, they're a little bit different. They work a little bit different. But the mechanism tends to be the same. The employer, who is typically based in a rich country, in the US, in the UK, in Canada, Australia, 
Western Europe, post a job and freelancers based both in rich and emerging countries bid for that job, place a bid for that job, and the employer then chooses the winner, basically looking at the amount of the bid and the online profile of the candidate. And just to show you, this is a mock profile of, of a candidate on freelancer. The, 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 they look like this, there's information about the skills, the, uh, re the reviews, the rating, here's the reputation from previous jobs, uh, the hourly rate, although that's typically only indicative, here's the hourly rate for, for John Smith. Uh, so basically there's two types of information. <coughs> the important thing is there's really two types of information. Voluntarily provided information, information that's not verified by the, by the platform, uh, the description and the skills, and then there's information that's verified and provided by the platform, which is the rating, the reputation, um, and so forth. And these platforms are, are, are great for a number of reasons uh, to, to study discrimination in hiring. One reason is that you can often observe the pool of candidates, um, and you can also observe the same information as the employer, which is not the case in traditional hiring, because in traditional hiring, for example, in a job interview, there is so much that you can't really observe or quantify. But here, oftentimes, we as researchers are observing the same information as the employer wants choosing between job candidates. So that's really great. And second, because if you can work with the platforms, we can do a few field experiments. Um, and I'm going to show you some of the, the ones that we've done uh, with, with one of those platforms. So here's the set of studies that, that we've done so far, <laughs> me and my collaborators and my team. So I divided them in observational studies, uh, which are based on transaction data from the platform, and experimental studies, where we actually do uh, an experiment in the platform. I will probably not get through all of these. I will try to get at least uh, to the teacher selection study. So talk about two exp uh, observational and one um, experimental study. So let me start with the first one, uh, and it's the, the one that uh, we call the Home Advantage Study. This was actually, I should mention, uh, published as a chapter in Mark's, uh, I don't know if it's your latest book, because you published so much, Mark, <laughs> but, but this is from 2019, uh, and this was uh, published in Mark's uh, recent book. And it's open access. And it's open access. Uh, digital <laughs> economies at, at the global margins. Um, so this is what we call, again, the Home um, Advantage Study. So let me premise this study by saying um, that if you have a little gray hair like me, you remember the late 90s and early 2000s, there were at least two very, very influential books about the internet and, and labor markets. Um, one of them was The Death of Distance by the economist uh, writer Francis Cancross, and then a little after came The World is Flat by Thomas Friedman, well-known New York Times opinion writer. And different books, but uh, the gist of the argument was very similar. The argument was that the internet is making geography or place redundant, that by connecting everyone into a borderless, seamless network, geography wouldn't matter anymore. And particularly, Friedman was very explicit about what it means for labor markets. And his argument was that as the service economy is growing, as jobs become digitized, employers will start contracting from workers around the world, and those workers would compete on a level playing field. So from an emerging country perspective, the internet would be drastically reducing barriers to entry into the high wage job markets and everybody, all the workers, will be competing essentially on the same footing, only on the basis of skills. So if you will, in, in more academic terms, Friedman would argue that the internet was reducing the spatial mismatch between the good jobs and the qualified workers, and gradually lead to wage convergence across countries. So that was his, his thesis largely in the world's flat. So in this study, we set out, in many ways, to set out this hypothesis. And 
you'll probably not be surprised that we found that Thomas Friedman was, was wrong. I may quit, he was flat out wrong. <laughs> because he overestimated the level playing field or in other words, he underestimated the fundamental problem in hiring, which is, of course, information asymmetry. Information asymmetry between the employer and the job candidate. So as you know, ability, commitment, those are things that cannot be directly observed by the employer. So the employer is always hiring on the basis of incomplete information and noisy signals. And those signals, when they're coming from emerging country workers, are more difficult to interpret, they're noisier, so that gives an advantage to the workers that are based in the same country as the employers, the, what we call the domestic workers. So we, we pose uh, that hypothesis contrary to uh, the work of, of, of Friedman, and we set to test it out, and um, we were lucky enough that freelancer agreed to give us a fairly large data set. So we had a large data set from freelancer.com. And it was a data set that included all the transactions for all the job posters and all the bids for their Spanish-speaking universe. So all that was in Spanish, they agreed to share with us. Um, so we had all the jobs and all the bids for those jobs for a period of about 14 months. And what we did was to, to we build a model, a statistical model, where we estimated the odds of winning a job or more technically, we estimated the odds of that bid being the winning bid. Controlling for the bid amount and for the observable characteristics of the job candidate. And here's the, the, the graph that's, that's really the main uh, result of, of that study. So here what we have is the odds ratio between the odds of the foreign worker relative to the odds of the domestic worker. And those are different models that control for more and more information variables, or more variables. So let's start here. So in this model, we only control for the amount of the bid. So if we only control for the amount of the bid, the odds of the foreign freelancer relative to the odds of the domestic freelancer are less than half. Now as you include more information, for example timing, timing is critical, the timing between the jobs posted and, and, and the bid, then the odds become a little closer. When you add experience, they become significantly closer. We'll come back to the, the world of experience. This is how many jobs you've had in the past on the platform. And you add more information and the odds get closer and closer. So basically, as more information is added to the model, the odds become closer to the, those of the domestic worker, which essentially means that employers are, are discriminating statistically. That is, that they are risk averse, and they prefer to hire from workers whose informational signals carry less uncertainty. And notice in particular the role of, you know, the big jump here in experience. So this means that lack of experience disproportionately penalizes foreign workers. Not having experience is disproportionately affecting foreign workers. And that's key because in all those platforms, getting your first job is the key. Without your first job, you can't build reputation. Without your first job, you can't have reviews. Without your first job, you can't have experience. So breaking that job, that first job barrier is a lot more difficult for the foreign worker than the domestic worker. And in fact, we do something else um, in the study, uh, which is not here, but it's in the chapter. Um, we do something called survival analysis. So we look at um, we'll, we'll look at the dropout rate of the workers, and we see that foreign workers are much more likely to sign up and drop in a period of about three months. Why? Because a worker signs up, bids and bids and bids, doesn't get jobs, and without a job, you can't build a reputation, you can't build experience, and then you just drop out of the platform. So this, this study generally is contributing to, to work by Mark and others that show that 
yes, there is a potential for, for workers in emerging regions in the gig economy, but there's many, many challenges. And it's also highlighting the central role that the platforms are playing, that the platforms are really not just matching employers and, and, and job candidates. They're not just intermediaries, but they're really shaping transactions because in, in, in any of the choices of what information to reveal and not to reveal, it's really shaping outcomes and the distribution of power be between employers and job candidates. And I'll, and I'll come back to that <coughs> in, in the uh, conclusions. So let me pivot to the second one. Um, just a study based on the same data set. But, but obviously the, um, the goal of the study and, and the theme of the study is different. So in this case, we're interested in uh, the gender dimension of the gig economy, and in particular, in gender sorting across jobs. So you, you're probably familiar with a popular or mainstream narrative that the gig economy is great for women. It's great for women. Why? Because women like to work from home. Women like to work odd jobs. They, um, they go in and out of the labor market. Um, they like flexible hours. So those, the narrative goes that those preferences of women match perfectly the kind of uh, uh, labor setting of the gig economy. So gig economy is great for women. That's, 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 that's the mainstream narrative. And in a way, this goes way back. Um, th there's a great book uh, by the sociologist named uh, Erin Hatton that talks about the feminization of temp work and really shows us this association uh, between women and the gig economy it goes way back in time to the post-war era and those maybe you're familiar in the US with the Cali girls and temp work way back in the 40s and 50s. So this really goes, goes way back. So we try to probe and challenge this narrative about the gig economy being great for women. And our perspective is particularly on what we call a gender sorting. So how online hiring is affecting the sorting of women, in men and women, into different types of jobs. So what we refer to is, is you know, we know that occupations today are less gender segregated than they were 50 years ago. But there's still a lot of evidence that women are overrepresented in low wage occupations, healthcare and education, and they are underrepresented in high wage, high demand occupations associated with STEM. Now, many people make the actual reverse argument. They say, because women are overrepresented in these occupations, that's the reason they're low wage. But regardless of the causality, of the direction of causality, the fact is, you know, reliable estimates would say that the, the, this difference in the types of occupations that women and men do explain about a third or more of the wage gap between men and women. So gender sorting into different occupations is a major uh, factor explaining wage gap between uh, men and women. So our question is, how is online hiring and the gig economy affecting gender sorting into different occupations and different career trajectories. So um, start with the breakdown of the bids in our data set. So this is the same data set of freelancer and this is now broken down by gender but also by job category. So these are job categories predefined by freelancers. So this is the more technical job category, software and web development. And you can see that most of the bid activity um, is by men. This is the more gender neutral category, arguably graphic design and media. You need a little technical, a little creative skill, so it's more gender neutral. This is about 40, 60. And this is about the distribution of actual freelancers in our sample. So th this is really no different than chance. This is the gender neutral category. And in the female jobs of writing and translation, so the more soft skills job, arguably the female jobs, you see more female bidding activity. Um, so this is interesting because this is conforming to the gender stereotypes of occupations. So we, we do the same. We build a model that estimates odds of winning conditional on 
first of all, conditional on a bid, a bid being accepted, and that's important, uh, but also conditional uh, on the bid amount and then characteristics of the freelancer. And of course, this time our main interest is not location as it was before, but it's gender, or rather the interaction between gender and job category. Promise, this is the only table like this from the, in the entire presentation, uh, but essentially you have three different models. These are conditional logic coefficient estimates, um, conditional meaning that the estimate is not done overall, but really clustered at the level of each job to reduce the heterogeneity between the different jobs. Uh, so it's, it's similar to, if you, if, you, if you know linear regression, similar to a sort of fixed effect regression uh, for, for a logit uh, model. So first interesting finding is overall women have a little bit of an advantage overall, which is interesting, and we can get, come back to that. Once you add the job category that we're interested in, which is the more technical one, software and web development, this is the high paid, highest paid category. Any bid in this category is more likely to be accepted. Why? Because there's less competition and less bids per job in this category. So any bid here is more likely to be a winning bid. But what we're really interested in is in the interaction between women applying for software and web development jobs. And this is where you see the coefficient is negative and highly significant. And then we actually subtract the main effect and interaction effect. Overall, what you get is women are about half, have about half the odds of having their bid accepted when they bid for a job in software and, and web development. So it's a very significant negative effect that's driving women away from jobs in software and development. Now at the same time, so this is an, a different way to look at it. We reproduce the model, but we separate into the different job categories. And this is really another way to look at the results. So the same model, the estimates, but now we have separated by categories. And this is really interesting because you can see that it's the coefficient for women is negative in software and, and web development not different from zero in graphic design and multimedia. So this is the gender neutral category, and you can see that the coefficient is really not different from zero. And then women actually have an advantage over men when they apply for the quote unquote female jobs. So again, a, a different way of looking at it, but same, same result. And this is the mechanism of sorting women away from technical jobs, which are the highest paid jobs, and into jobs that are the female jobs, the variety and translation, which are significantly paying lower than those jobs. So let's talk about mechanisms. What do we believe is happening here? What's behind this? In both studies, both in the Home Advantage study and in this study, what we believe is at work is that the hiring penalty for foreign workers and for women in tech jobs is the result of a, of a hiring context that favors the activation of stereotypes and the use of heuristics to filter candidates. So in different disciplines, this has different names. The behavioral economists would call system one versus system two thinking. The social psychologists would talk about different cognitive paths for impression formation. But the idea is the same. The idea is in the context of limited and noisy information about job candidates. Small value of the projects. Small odds of repeated interactions. Employers tend to activate heuristics to filter and, and select. And this is consistent with all the social psychology literature, which would tell us that stereotypes are more likely to be activated in situations of cognitive overload, and time pressure. So to bring this down to, to a more concrete example, what I did was, was the following. Just to, to, to illustrate the, the, how, this, how this works uh, practically. So yesterday, about this time, 5 p.m., I posted a job on Freelancer. So let me try this. I'm going to post a job on Freelancer. Very simple. So pretty much any, anybody could apply. 
it was a data entry job. And I said, I need somebody to input data from a paper directory into an Excel spreadsheet, period. That's it. How much? So I put the, I uh, click the standard pay rate for freelancer suggested, which is about $20 an hour, which is what I would pay a grad student in the US. I don't know how much you guys are paid in grad students, but this is about the rate here 20, uh, in, in the US, $20 for a grad student. This is how much I would pay a grad student. So I put that on, on freelance. Let's see what, see what happens. So let me show you what happened. So this is what happened. I want to draw attention to here. In one hour, so I left it open one hour. One hour. I closed it at six. I got almost 70 bids. True, you will always get more bids in the first hour and most of the bids in the first 24 hours. Mark knows that very well, all those of us that work in this area very well. But you get the idea of just the amount of bidding and the volume of freelancers. And you get bids from uh, Bangladesh and Venezuela <coughs> and China, Pakistan, and so and so on. And you can go and go and go. So this is how much volume exists and how fluid those markets are. And we believe that this is what acts activating stereotypes because even for a small job as, 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 as the one we posted, uh, we get so much bidding activity that <coughs> employers are using the heuristics to select between the different job and the job candidates. So, um, I probably have time for the third study um, that I want to talk about, and this is an experimental study. So this is ongoing work. Um, the other two are already published. This is ongoing with a couple of my students. Um, and this is taking a little a bit of a twist on, 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 the, um, on the arguments. So this is about teacher selection. And we're working with a, a platform called italki, which Probably anybody heard of italki? So it's 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 so uh, freelancer Upwork is a large general purpose platforms, all kinds of jobs. Italki is for language learning, connecting language teachers with language students all over the world. So that's the, they're, they're what's called vertical. They only connect teachers and students, language teachers and language uh, students. So this is, this is related to the home advantage study, but what we really want to understand here is the association between language and place. So if you talk to linguists or language learning experts, they would argue that what really matters is teacher training, that the teacher is trained, that the teacher can teach the language. And in fact, some argue that it's best to learn a language with a teacher that's a native in your own language because it un understands better the challenges of making that transition and the code switching and whatnot. But we hypothesize that on the other hand, this system one thinking uh, in online hiring would tend to associate language teaching proficiency with a specific country. For example, English. English is the, the most demanded uh, language on italki and what we hypothesize is that students would tend to associate English with the UK and the US and Australia and teachers that are born and raised in these countries. That teacher will have a preference for native speakers over any qualified, highly qualified teacher from a non-native uh, non country or a country where English is not the main uh, language. So we test out this hypothesis. And because we're collaborating with Italki, we're able to do what's called a, a discrete choice experiment. So this, this is a, a technique that would elicit preference uh, by uh, varying different variables, different teaching characteristics. So what we essentially do is we present choices to students of teachers with different characteristics. And we basically vary three things. We vary the gender. So we present male and female teachers. We vary uh, native and non-native status. And we vary training. Uh, trained teacher, qualified teacher, and somebody who doesn't have any teacher qualifications. 
this is the kind of profile that we build. This is the actual profile. So this is one of the profiles. So we have eight profiles, right? So two by two by two, we have eight possible profiles. This is one of the profiles. So this is Min, who is a male from Korea. So gender male based in Korea, so non-native, but highly qualified because he has a master degree in language teaching, which we don't know if, if it exists, but it sounds like very <laughs> impressive, um, and teaches English full time. So a qualified teacher. So this is one of the eight profiles that we present. And we don't present, we present profiles in pairs. So that's what the discrete choice experiment is that we present. So would you choose this or this? Would you choose this or this? So we don't present all the options. If you do the math, it's uh, 26 possible combinations. Uh, we don't present them all, but we, we, we have an algorithm to maximize our variance. So we, we present four options to, um, to, the, um, to the students. This is ongoing work, but let me, let me preview some of the, uh, what I think are the most interesting results. Probably the most interesting result is that, as you would expect, students prefer qualified teachers. But they prefer to a fairly small degree. It's about a 25% advantage of being qualified versus not being qualified. But being a native speaker, that increases the odds of being chosen by four, four times more. So there's a really, really strong preference for native teachers over any kind of qualification that you could uh, you could add to, to, to the teacher. So we, we think it's, it's interesting because obviously again the market is not flat, it's tilted in favor of native speakers and is, is an association that does not disappear in an online context. And in fact, um, and here's where we're building uh, our theory, is we believe that this association between language and place might be even stronger, maybe even, even stronger in the online context. And the reason is a lot of the motivation for language learning in italki is what we call intrinsic and not extrinsic. That is, there are a lot of people that want to learn a language because they want to get a better job and they want to study abroad, yes. But there's a lot of people that learn a language because they want to appropriate a culture. There's a lot of people that want to learn Japanese because they love manga. There's a lot of people that want to study English because they love Disney and Ariana Grande. So there's all this cultural appropriation, this intrinsic motivation. There's people that want to learn the language just to talk to somebody in a different country, in a different language. So all these motivations, we think, are making that connection between language and place even stronger and, 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 and thus creating that strong preference for, for the native speaker in, in italki. OK. Um, Wrapping up with a few takeaways, uh, the, the first one, most obvious one, is human bias is, is perversive in online hiring, perhaps more so than in, in traditional hiring. Second, uh, platform design choices matter. It matters what kind of information is revealed and what information is not revealed, how the interaction between the employer and the job candidate is structured, the algorithms that sometimes are involved in sorting candidates or recommending candidates for jobs, all this greatly affects the outcome and shapes the distribution of power between employer and candidates. So the point here is platforms are not neutral facilitators of matching, but they're really arbiters of transactions. And, and because of that, um, I believe they have not just a legal, but, but a moral responsibility to address discrimination in hiring um, and, and more generally to protect uh, labor rights. So this, I think it's the same discussion, uh, if you allow me the analogy, with Facebook and Twitter. We know now that Facebook and Twitter are not just the neutral conduits of news and information because their choices shape public discourse. So in the same way that the choices of Facebook and Twitter are, are, are shaping public discourse, the choices of online hiring platforms are shaping outcomes in this online labor markets. And finalize the, the last point is that, of course, there's a lot more to understand about this rather complex relation between human and, 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 and machine bias in online context and online hiring in particular. And the more we understand this, 
the more appropriate the policy remedies will be to address um, uh, discrimination and protect uh, labor rights. And, 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 and I also want to remind that sometimes the answer is, is not, not trivial of, of what is the appropriate policy remedy uh, because, again, there is a, a very delicate and something, sometimes we don't quite understand this balance between machine bias and human bias. And let me just finalize with this, um, something that's ha happening now, which is in my own state of California, we passed AB5. So AB5 is a law that in California basically is trying to make uh, basically transportation, a ride sharing services, Uber and Lyft, recognize drivers as their uh, employees. So in order to avoid that, Uber and Lyft are saying, no, no, they are not our employees. And we're giving them more control. One of the ways in which they're giving more, more control to avoid categorizing them as, employer, uh, as employees is by actually revealing information about who's taking a ride and where. So remember, in, in Lyft and Uber and ride sharing, the driver has no information on the passenger or the destination until it, it, it actually accepts the drive and then and picks up the, the passenger, of course. So there is no previous information on that. So now they're saying, no, we are going to reveal the information, so give back more control to the rider. That sounds great. But now we already have reports of low-income areas not being served by Uber and Lyft because they refuse to go into these areas like the taxi drivers used to do not so long ago. Like the great Lenny Kravitz remind us in Mr. Cab Driver, they are notoriously racist, the taxi drivers. Uh, so again, this is just to illustrate that often the answers and the remedies have unintended consequences and they're not simple and there's so much we still need to understand. Thank you, now. Open for questions.